Uh, I want to thank the planning committee behind today's event and all the events this year in the series. Above all, Annette Leroux, who's the chair of the planning committee from sociology, Regina Austin from the law school, Martha Farah from psychology, my colleague in political science, Julia Lynch, uh, Matt Roth in the Mitchell Center, and Eric Ortz, who, as I said, is moderating and introducing uh, the event for us. I want to thank him for doing so much to inspire today's events. Eric is the Guardsmark Professor at the Warden School. He is the Director of the Initiative for Global Environmental Leadership. I think we need a lot of global environmental leadership, so thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and um, uh, is a scholar of numerous topics, um, perhaps most known for his work on uh, the firm and questions of corporate responsibility and ethics in our time. But also in recent times, the author of provocative articles in both academic venues and the popular press, uh, making proposals for how uh, the American regime in particular might reform itself. He's proposed, for example, that the Senate does not in fact require necessarily that each state elect only two representatives, two senators. And in a way somewhat analogous to Sam Moyne, looks at something that might seem obvious and uncontroversial, that the Senate has two senators, and that each state has two senators, and suggests upon historical analysis that in fact uh, the, the historical record suggests something different, that there were untaken paths and perhaps future opportunities that we would do well to pursue. Um, so I want to uh, thank him again for uh, being here with us and um, doing so much to inspire today's event. Thank you, thank you, Senator. Europe, 
only 759 in India, 673 in Latin America, and only 170 in Africa. The most recent report from Oxfam, Oxfam finds that the world's about 2,000, no more than 2,000 billionaires have more wealth than 4.6 billion people who make up 60% of the planet's population. Another revealing statistic, the 22 richest men, and they are men, in the world have more wealth than all of the women in Africa combined. So this is a large theme, and I'll make one last comment about the relevance that I believe this research has for people like me who teach in business schools and also on corporate law and finance types in law schools. I don't see too many of them here, but they should be. As I mentioned, um, so what do we teach at Wharton? We teach people how to learn the skills that they can that they need to go into consulting, into finance, into banking, and other business professions. But we and we teach the tools that they need uh, uh, by which the, the important point is that the, these tools that we're teaching them are the tools that are also increasing the economic inequality. So for example, reorganizations in many private equity and bankruptcy transactions, other mergers and acquisitions, and executive pay for performance contracts that are based more on stock and stock options than other measures. Um, business scholars, as well as legal academics in, in these, in these uh, in the corporate and financial areas should be more reflective and critical about the so social implications of what we teach. And in general, there's not very much critical examination of some of those, uh, in some of those fields in particular. Moyne's work shows us that the radically unequal world we live in today has become a dystopia. But it is a world that we have made ourselves, and knowing this, we can act to change it. Please welcome Professor Moyne back to that. Okay, well, I hope you can hear me. I sound loud. Uh, I, I really appreciate the invitation from Jeff, uh, at least by email, and, and thanks to Eric for putting my name in and, and under however much duress for <laughs> giving me such a lovely introduction. I'm very grateful. As, as has been mentioned, I, I wrote a book recently about human rights and the inequality crisis, and what I'll try to do in my time is just review the basic arguments. I'm trying to make in that and uh, hopefully leave ample time for discussion and disagreement. So I'll begin where I begin the book with someone's vision. Uh, it's the vision of this woman, uh, a Czechoslovak activist. Uh, her name, as you can see, is Dana Tomidova. She uh, gave a lecture on a trip to the West around 1980. She had been involved in protesting the activities of the Czechoslovak communist state uh, and had founded uh, with some friends and associates Charter 77, which was once extremely well known, uh, one of the first uh, organizations worldwide that gave the idea of human rights uh, a huge significance that it never possessed in international politics. Uh, and for her trouble, her state uh, had pursued her, she'd had her head pounded into the pavement at one point for demanding human rights, including very basic civil liberties. She was in the West because the Czechoslovak state uh, told her to take a break uh, and uh, leave the East for a while. And when she was in the West, they made it permanent and she uh, lived in exile ever since. Uh, and yet, when she gave this lecture, with which I'm beginning my lecture, uh, she surprised her listeners. It was in Dublin. And she told them that while they had been right to invite her uh, as a human rights activist, she wanted to communicate to them in the West that they also needed her uh, because she was an emissary of socialism. She recalled that she had lived through as a child what we call the Czech coup in the 1940s, when communism had taken over. Uh, and yet she experienced it as a moment of class level, when privileges that she had not had before became open to her and indeed millions of others 
things that have been reserved to the then 1% of, of, of the Czech lands were open to all. Now, she insisted that sadly socialism had since become an alibi for the denial of her human rights and the human rights of those same millions, uh, even if there had been some distributive equality achieved too. But she told her audience that she didn't want the reverse to happen, for human rights to become an alibi for the abandonment of socialism. Well, that's what happened. Uh, this is, I won't inflict my engrams on you much more, just once, uh, I think. This is an engram that Google gives us to track the salience of words, names, and phrases. And it's just a fact that the age of human rights is the age, at least lexically or linguistically, of the cratering of socialism. And we know that that's had real effects uh, in different places. It's quite amazing when you look at the, um, the, the chronology of the lines because uh, uh, there are certain features that I think we have to begin with. First is just the sheer popularity of socialism as a word passing people's lips or against it. Uh, for most of the 20th century relative to the relative insignificance of the phrase human rights. And this is true in all the languages that Google allows us to test. Uh, and then something shocking happens. And it happens to the lines at the same time. The inflection point, if you were to draw a line between the peak of socialism <coughs> Uh, and this strange moment when whatever had happened before human rights begins its spectacular career is basically the same moment in the middle of the 1970s. The lines cross in 1989, and our world, I think, can be read pretty clearly off of this chart, our moral world. Now, a couple of provisos. First, Few of you will want to allow me to say that human rights won out in the age of the death of socialism and the age of victory of the rich because human rights are in crisis. Uh, no one cares about them, least of all Donald Trump and assorted other despots. And I, I agree. Let's come back to that in the end. Um, but the, 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 the other proviso I think we ought to offer, especially this week, is that this data ends in the late 2000s, which is to say before the Bernie Sanders candidacy. But maybe we'll come back to that too, and if not in this lecture, in American politics next week and in future weeks. Uh, I'm making an intervention really thinking about that first line of the human rights line. I've made various interventions, and there's a whole field now, which I've tried to retire from, debating when did human rights come about. Um, and uh, I'm really going to focus on this post-war era with a look back to the 19th century uh, to try to understand why initially the idea of human rights canonized by the United Nations in 1948 and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights had so little uptake relative to our own time. And then why indeed it took off in the period in which socialism, hitherto much more popular, cratered at least until uh, the Vermont senator entered the fray. Um, uh, so uh, what I want to do is get conceptual for a bit and then tell my story. I want to have uh, a little debate uh, with of Karl Marx and, and a Marxist interpretation of this development that human rights became our highest ideology in the era of the victory of the rich. Uh, because Marx, I think, would not have been surprised by this outcome. And we can either take his view or try to uh, elaborate some other view. Now let me begin with a, a kind of pre-Marxian insight which is that how we organize political economy 
how we produce, how we distribute and exchange is so important in every society that it will have a huge bearing on everything else going on. And that includes what moral ideals people think are plausible and what moral movements they choose to form. That's not Marxism, that's social theory. And every social theorist worth his salt from this old Baron Montesquieu to Emil Durkheim and Knox Weber believe that. Uh, and it seems like there's no way to reject it. Uh, we may have some philosophers out there or lawyers uh, who think that they can frame their ideals or found their movements freely, but we know that's wrong. So what we're looking for is to characterize correctly exactly how this big thing called political economy, the way we choose to produce and exchange and distribute, bears on our moral ideals. Marx had a very specific thesis about that, uh, and a very specific thesis about rights. In his youth, he wrote an essay called On the Jewish Question, and he claimed a couple of things. One, that material reality uh, had not just a big effect, but an almost exclusive influence on everything else going on, not least what he called ideology, the moral ideals people uh, frame. And rights were a classic example, because though presented as for everyone, everywhere, and always, human rights were in fact the ideology of the ascendant bourgeoisie. That's who they protected. That's what the rights protected. Um, and his claim was that rights are inflexibly an ideology that will serve the middle class uh, at the expense of the rest. He inferred from this, let's call that the inflexibility thesis, that human rights were going to be unsalvageable as an ideology of workers' emancipation. Now, he vacillated about this later in his career, and actually, if you look at Marx as an organizer, he actually argued for some workers' rights. But in on the Jewish question, he said that because uh, of the causal relationship between the mode of production and ideology, uh, rights were inflexibly a bourgeois concept that had to be abandoned if we were to move from so-called political emancipation that the bourgeoisie had sponsored to so-called human emancipation. Now, what I basically want to do in this lecture is take seriously, as any serious thinker must who's heard about social theory, the proposition that we're not free-floating our ideals have some relationship to everything else we're doing, especially the political economy we've created to make our stuff and get it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Marx's narrower arguments about rights, their inflexibility and unsalvageability hold. And what I want to claim is that that leaves us with a, maybe a different view than Marx would take facing this sad fact that human rights have become ascendant in our time with the return of class inequality and the victory of the rich. Okay, so that's my plan. Uh, and I'm going to go through just to be very simple-minded and hopefully with three stages. I'll just glance at Marx's 19th century uh, and then I'll look at the era of the welfare state and how the meaning of rights changed in that crucial period in the middle of the 20th century. And then I'll look at our own time of human rights, the death of socialism, and the ascendancy of what some people call neoliberalism. Now before I proceed, I just want to put one uh, further idea on the table. Uh, which is going to be crucial to uh, the way my story at least ends. 
I want to introduce a distinction in, that I owe to moral philosophers between sufficient provision and distributive inequality uh, as things that you could pursue. You could pursue neither one, the other, or both. The idea of distributive sufficiency is that there's some threshold of entitlement that people ought to reach when it comes to some set of things, the good things in life or the decencies of life. And um, we could imagine that we could monetize and aggregate and give people a universal basic income set at that threshold and argue that they're morally entitled to that much. We can also give a list of, of the different things to which people are entitled, which can't be aggregated and traded off against each other. Things like a house and water and healthcare, and they have a right to all of them. And then what matters if you believe in sufficient provision is that each person get those rights Call them economic and social rights vindicated. Bernie Sanders, just to come back to him, is for a human right to health care, which appears to be a commitment to sufficient provision. Now, way back into the past of modern times, there have been thinkers who have said our moral duty is just to get our fellow human beings, citizens, human beings, to that line of sufficient provision. And then our moral duty ends. And it may be that there are class disparities, but they're not immoral anymore because everyone has reached the line of sufficient provision. As you can see, this is debatable, but I believe Thomas Paine is the first to hold this so-called sufficientarian position. He says straight out, I don't care how rich the rich are if the poor are lifted out of poverty. Uh, maybe his views are more complex. It doesn't matter. Today there is this famous philosopher up the road who uh, became well known because Princeton recycled an old essay of his called On Bullshit and made millions. And they tried it again uh, with another old essay that they, they published as On Inequality. And once again, his position is that actually inequality, the stuff that Eric was reciting, which sounds horrendous, is not immoral. Only poverty is immoral. So it's, it's, it's this position. Now, many people, not so much today, but in the past, have been committed to what I want to think of as a separate ideal, egalitarian distribution. Uh, and that position is that it matters how rich the rich are too no matter if the poor are no longer poor because they've reached this threshold of sufficient provision. Uh, and socialism that rose and fell was, among other things, uh, a commitment to egalitarian distribution. Now, you don't need to think that every egalitarian is going to demand absolute quality of outcomes, almost none have. If you have any concern for a moral entitlement above sufficient provision, then you're, you're in the neighborhood of equality. And um, I might come back to whether that's enough clarity about what I mean by egalitarianism later. Okay, so I want to get my story going uh, with this background in mind. Let's start just very briefly with savage century capitalism, uh, when Karl Marx look out, looked out, and rightly, I think, or he was, he made his mistake for good reason, for understandable reasons, concluded that rights were no friend to the working man. Why? If we look out, uh, most rights protection, indeed, you could argue most rights movements were about the formal emancipation of human beings so that they could speak and vote uh, if they had enough money and property, uh, including in this country, uh, but not about 
creating the circumstances for them to exercise those freedoms. And so, way into the 19th and indeed into the 20th century, it could well look as if the very idea of rights was just a smokescreen for the ascendancy of those who had enough or a lot. Uh, and we can tell that by looking at the actual causes that uh, rights defenders pursued, if we're honest. Uh, chiefly those were the causes of free transaction, immune from state interference, and a sacrosanct private property. And indeed, if we look hard, the other causes that we think of as more uplifting in retrospect, like emancipation of chattel slaves, or equality for women, were very closely linked to this idea of a world of supposedly free labor uh, uh, amongst uh, transacting uh, uh, capitalist subjects. And so maybe he was mistaken. Maybe there's more detail to have about the 19th century. But it, it just wasn't very surprising that looking out at that point, Marx and the Marxists who followed him concluded that rights were inflexible and unsalvageable. And indeed, when he looked down at the actual effects of 19th century political economy, uh, there was growth. But we know that there was enormous insufficiency uh, causing the labor movement to mobilize. And we produced the greatest class inequality and the greatest global inequality hitherto known to human history. Uh, and so if we stop the story at this point, we have to concede a lot, I think, to Karl Marx. Uh, and the question is, would rights, rights mobilization, prove flexible and therefore salvageable in later periods, including our own? Well, I think they did. Uh, we know that in, you know, in a very broad narrative of modern political economy, what succeeded classical uh, political economy, uh, the night watchman state and so forth, was the welfare state, achieved through a mobilization of working people, a crisis of capitalism that vaulted lots of politicians, not just liberals like Franklin Roosevelt, but fascists and communists, into power. Uh, to use the state uh, to address the misery uh, of modern uh, political economy. And I just want to generalize very uh, broadly about this moment because, again, we're not interested so much in the economics and politics of this moment as on what lessons it has for the uh, uh, flexibility and salvageability of rights. But just very briefly, what did these welfare states as they emerged across the North Atlantic uh, in the early through the middle of the 20th century do? Uh, well, they grew the state and they gave it tasks. And if we look, it seems as if those states adopted both of those twin ideals that I outlined at the start. They cared a lot about abject misery. But if we look, especially the further east towards the new Soviet Union we travel, we find that these states also talk the talk and even walk the walk of distribution and equality. Not least, because whether in its eastern communist form or its western more liberal form, there were lots and lots of socialists. And I mean, Quality matters and states achieve it, although in very different ways and with lots of exclusions. Uh, fascist states obviously exclude lots of people, but even non fascist states are exclusionary. Internally, the welfare state is, if you like, a political economy for white male workers. Women don't get entitled except as part of the, the 
family wage, which is it's on the rise in this period. Uh, and those who are racialized, not just Jews under uh, Nazi rule, but blacks in this country and colonial subjects under empires, don't get the same protections as white male workers. These are Donald Trump's voters in the making. Uh, and then we look uh, at the welfare state in global terms and see that it wasn't just exclusionary internally, but its project of sufficient provision and equal distribution was very much marked by nationalism. It was bound to a project to create fair spaces of distribution state by state and nation by nation. Uh, and certainly not uh, for the whole world. Actually, in the era from the 30s to the 1960s, even as national equality, it, sorry, national inequality decreased, global inequality increased, and even when empire ended, it continued increasing. Okay, so that's the first point about this era of the welfare state. And what I want to argue is that it had a big effect on the idea of rights and practices of rights. Most people, it's true, most reformers, not just Marxists, had been so convinced uh, by their experience of the 19th century story of rights that they would just rejected the idea altogether. Uh, a great example is a liberal, J.A. Hobson, who's in 1901 observes that he can't find even liberals who think that rights are going to be a plausible ideal for fair reform. They're so closely associated with the defense of contract, like in Lockwood, New York, and property, against any redistributive politics, that it may be that Marx was at least right that they're inflexible and insolvable, even for the rights. And yet we know that there is a parallel story in which some people try to invent a new category of rights beyond uh, civil liberties. And this is the moment, not of the invention, but of the canonization of economic and social rights. Uh, and so uh, my conclusion from this brief survey is that the welfare state is a very ambivalent moment in the history of rights. It's true it allows them to demonstrate some flexibility, but not everyone is on board with their centrality. Uh, and yeah, uh, they, they have been given some kind of big lease on life. Just as an example, one, you know, in a huge picture of how the idea of, of social rights could figure. Let's take this classic example of T.H. Marshall, an English sociologist a really, probably the greatest Anglophone theorist of the welfare state. And he gives some famous lectures at the University of Cambridge in the late 40s, published as Citizenship and Social Class. And he says, what's happening in the welfare state is precisely the canonization of social rights. We had had political and civil before. They protected some things as well as a capitalist social order. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, we've added something, created a welfare state, and the thing we've added are social rights. <clears throat> Note, though, that he discusses these rights in a very interesting way. He says, these are not just rights of sufficient provision. Uh, the welfare state is also about distributional equality his metaphors of a building. We would never provide a floor of protection without also building a ceiling on inequality. Now he probably said this because he was under the grip of an illusion. Uh, it seems to follow that if you want to spend a lot more 
to bring the poor out of poverty, the rich must be for it. And so automatically, by focusing on sufficient provision, you single-handedly address distributional inequality, at least to some extent. And that happened in his social world, of course, because like in the United States in the old days, the rich had to start paying a lot of taxes to support the new social ventures. And they got poor. And not just did distributional, I'm sorry, sufficient provision come online in various things like the National Health Service in that country, less good things than others. But distributional inequality contracted. Um, my point is that beyond his illusion, it really mattered to him that social rights were just another name for the project of the welfare state to embrace both of these ideals of sufficient provision and, and in some greater modicum of distributional equality. Now, I even think we've reread this old document that no one really cared much about for so long, though it came up at the very moment of the welfare state, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, it canonizes at the international level economic and social rights. And probably for most of those few who heard or cared about it, in its moment of 1948, it was just, let's say, like a charter for the project all the states of that time across the Atlantic were undertaking, welfare states. It was not a charter for transnational human rights activism, or, or at least no one understood it to be such because there wasn't one. Okay, a brief interlude before we come to our moment. Um, I've talked about the global north in this lecture, um, and uh, I did mention the sad fact that the end of empire actually increased global inequality. Even as this unprecedented thing in modern circumstances, the moderation of class inequality happened in the global north in the middle of the 20th century. Global inequality, which had been skyrocketing for centuries, continued to increase. What did post-colonial statesmen do? Well, their main goal, I would argue, was to transplant the northern welfare state to their lands under the same nationalist auspices that of a strong state. The trouble is they were poor. Uh, and so in the book, I talk a great deal about these characters who decide that inequality conceived of as a problem at the national level uh, is too, uh, too limited and that the world needs a plan for the moderation of global class inequality. And in fact, in the middle of the 1970s, though some of these statesmen talked about uh, sufficient provision, their main goal nationally and in the 1970s internationally was to plan for a global welfare state. And they even say things like, we're in the global south like the trade unions of the world. Uh, but of course, uh, their dreams um, didn't come true, at least in the way that they anticipated. Okay, so now I come to the main event, I guess, which is how does this story of the partial but real flexibility uh, of human rights in the middle of the 20th century, at least at the national level, in the invention of social rights, bear on the story of our time? Uh, which seems to be, as Marx would have predicted, and as uh, Susan Marx, who's well-named heir, insists, uh, a time in which the 19th story, 19th century story happens again. Uh, it's a story in which rights become uh, moral ideas behind us, but the real winners are the rich uh, and class inequality having been moderated in some places uh, expands again. Uh, she says, the real last utopia is not human rights. I have claimed that 
you know, she said, Sam is wrong. Not that many people care about human rights, and to the extent that they do, they're fooled um, into supporting, not challenging, a neoliberal regime, which is the utopia for enough people that it was built. And of course, it's true, as Eric reported, uh, we now know in much greater detail than before that the age of human rights is, among other things, uh, a neoliberal age of the increase in distributional inequality. The most famous findings on this are from the French economist Thomas Piketty, and they relate to the uh, Anglo countries. And we can talk about elsewhere if you want. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of places later. But his basic finding is that the era of human rights is the era of the victory of the 1% who capture more and more a share of the gross national product, returning to the amount that they once claimed in the later 19th and early 20th centuries. How do we make sense of this? Well, I want to begin this uh, last phase of the lecture by noting some complications for any easy conclusion that human rights have just been a smokescreen for the return of class inequality. So for one thing, human rights in the 19th century really did mean the most people the defense of contract and power. Uh, but if you go out in the road to the extent people have heard of human rights, they think it's about free speech and freedom uh, from torture. They don't think that human rights are a capitalist program. They think it, they're a reform program pursued by noble activists and NGOs. And so at least at the level of language, which is something, human rights did not get won back by uh, the advocates of, uh, of neoliberalism. At the beginning, actually, of the neoliberal story, economists like Friedrich Hayek actually proposed that very step. If you go back to the road to serve Hayek says, I'm, I'm a human rights activist. I don't understand why this isn't our language, uh, but it never would become his language. Second complication or proviso. The neoliberal era in which we're living has been the greatest for what I now want to call status equality, by contrast to distributional equality. The welfare as I said, was internally exclusive. Uh, it privileged white males. Uh, and our age, while by no means creating anything close to perfect, has attended, like none before, to uh, the injustice suffered by those treated differently because of the kind of people they are, especially the kind of bodies they have racialized, gender, disabled, indigenous. Uh, and uh, the human rights movement, though not the sole agent of the pursuit of status equality, is tightly linked to that pursuit. Uh, and so not only is human rights not just a sham project for neoliberals defending contract and property and inequality, it actually is something that's about protecting important values, uh, namely what I call status egalitarian values. Finally, to be completely fair, after the Cold War, human rights movements and law began to remember that their biblical document, this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, had featured economic and social rights. It's kind of an amazing thing in retrospect that in Tommy Nova's 1970s moment, when Amnesty International wins the Nobel Prize and Human Rights Watch in this country uh, is founded, these brand new uh, activists forget about the second half of the list of human rights they are sworn to defend. 
it's only fair to acknowledge that these activists try to right the balance, at least to some limited extent. And uh, especially in court, and thanks to their canonization in constitutions like the South African and East European constitutions, economic and social rights become important. However, their rights to sufficient provision. And what I want to focus on is that, that even once human rights movements made this correction after the Cold War, even once economic and social rights began to be taken seriously, they did not care about, let alone pursue, egalitarian aims distributionally. Uh, and so this is something that needs to be, I believe, at the heart of any interpretation of the relation of the idea and practices of human rights and the now neoliberal political economy of our time. So what I'm str struggling for, uh, in, in contradistinction to a Marxist view, is, a, is what I'm calling an ecological view. It's that old lesson of social theory that, of course, our ideals and practices are affected by, live within, the ecology set up by the way we produce and exchange and distribute. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the Marxist that they're just a smokescreen is correct. Uh, in particular, what I want to suggest is that what's really mattered in our time is that human rights have become allied to a, a larger family of moral projects, prioritizing status and quality, and distributed without the sufficient provision, but ignoring distri distributional inequality. They're building Marshall's floor. No ceiling is in view. It's not resulting magically. Not only that, it's being obliterated as the rich soar ever higher in our time as Eric reported. And the suggestion is that human rights fit in that ecology. Socialism could not with its egalitarian challenge its insistence that whatever happens at the level of the floor distribution line, the ceiling matters too. It disappeared, human rights did not. And yet, human rights don't matter. They not only protect civil liberties, but uh, the status and quality of people who have been excluded and the distributional, the sufficient provision of the worse off. So I'm arguing against a, a stronger view, a, a, a Marxist view that says if we look, uh, we find that it's worse than I'm suggesting. Human rights as an idea is inflexible or it distracts from the pursuit of egalitarian justice or it's actively in cahoots with neoliberalism as her new book, uh, much more radical than mine by Jess White morals of the market alleges. Uh, and I want to I wanna come to a slightly less critical view, although um, I still want uh, us to think hard about human rights and the place they should have in our moral vocabulary and practical politics. So that's how I'm going to conclude uh, with that idea. Let me just uh, say that to substantiate this account would require uh, in this third stage, much more time than you want to give me. Uh, because between that 1970s moment when human rights took off in tandem with neoliberalism, it's been a long time. Uh, how many decades? Five almost. And there are just a lot of places that we have to cover. Uh, if there was cooperation in after Salvador Allende was toppled in Chile between uh, neoliberals uh, and uh, Augusto Pinochet's regime. That's one place. But the neoliberal story, even within Latin America, has to be reserved for the next decade. 
uh, in Anglo countries, especially in the United Kingdom and states. There's a crucial break in 1979-80, but not immediately in Western Europe. And then in Eastern Europe, we are thinking of the 1990s. And that's just to think about regions and countries. We know in the historiography of political economy in our time, we have to ascend to the level of international financial institutions, like the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, uh, across the same long chronology. So there's lots of detail that I would have to inflict on you. But rather, I just want to conclude with a kind of bottom line guess and then some, let's say, floral or prescriptive conclusions. My bottom line guess is that we should recognize that human rights, unlike socialism, fit well in a neoliberal ecology uh, because they could be accommodated within it and represent an uplifting creed for those who consented to live in our political economy of the victory of the rich. After all, at best, human rights were about building a floor, even as much more powerful forces were destroying the old ceiling on inequality that uh, welfare states had modestly institutionalized. So if you like, it's a story of parallel play. These two projects are not threatening to each other. And in fact, uh, you could get sinister and say it's helpful for neoliberals for there to be less poverty, less glaring evil in the system that uh, their policies are setting up. Marshall couldn't imagine that building a floor would coexist with the obliteration of the ceiling, but that's our world. And just to you know, indicate that it's a global story, uh, we should a look outside the global north where a uh, find in a place like China since its own marketization. Uh, you have simultaneously the salvation of the most human beings from so-called extreme poverty, a dollar and change a day uh, in world history by any nature in the shortest time. Hundreds of millions in tandem with the most rapid expansion of class inequality in an allegedly communist state, again in world history in the shortest time. And these two facts have to be related. Uh, so you get the same distributional signature many, many places, not everywhere, but this country, China, India, uh, where the poor are uh, not ceasing from the land, as the Bible said would never happen. Uh, there's so long, a lot, too many, but many less than ever, well, uh, certainly uh, relative to overall population. But the rich are the real winners. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll conclude there um, with some kind of final comments about like what one would do if this is remotely plausible. I'm for human rights, uh, even just civil liberties, and they ought to be pursued, and there ought to be someone out there pursuing them. Professor Ben Nathans uh, is here, and he wrote a, a, at least the first half, extremely generous uh, review of my book in the New York Review of Books, and he took me to have a lesson for human rights movements. That's not what I was trying to do. Uh, uh, actually, in response to some of these ideas, I've seen two opposite claims emanating from human rights movements. One is that uh, inequality is not their problem. They never said it was their job to face it. And simultaneously, that they've always faced it and in fact successfully done so. So they have to work out you know, what memo they're sending. I actually agree with Ben's point uh, that it's defensible to have selective, 
moral action. And for there to be groups that don't pursue social justice or global justice generally, uh, and to have civil libertarian groups, and to have groups that uh, may be absent economic and social rights, neither saying anything about economic inequality, because their goals are noble, even so. Absolutely. I would go further and argue that the kinds of groups that human rights movements are seem to me very unlikely to be forceful for egalitarian purposes. The forceful movements have been historically trade unions and socialist parties, not uh, philanthropically funded NGOs. Uh, and I think we should just let them keep doing what they're doing. The question is, do we rest content with human rights? Do we spend as much of our energy and do we send our children to work for those NGOs and think of them as the highest activity? Um, and there I respectfully part ways uh, with, with, uh, with some. Uh, and in fact, I would take it further. We can have a debate amongst moral philosophers, I know there's at least one here, about how we assess the relative importance of human rights in distributive equality. Maybe we conclude that as long as there's one African child starving, or one down the street, uh, inequality is not yet a moral problem. I believe that's a position known as prioritarianism. Maybe. I personally wouldn't go that far. I, I am nostalgic, at least to this extent, for the welfare state, uh, because it said we can address both distributive uh, insufficiency and inequality simultaneously and as part of the same project. But even if you're a moral philosopher, you have a very good case for prioritizing human rights or human rights extended with uh, 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 economic and social rights. I'd suggest that our time requires you to think strategically. Uh, and I'll close with that idea. Human rights have seen in the cold light of the history of our time to be hostage to um, stagnating middle classes who are upset. Not even civil liberties, let alone economic and social provision protecting uh, sufficiency, uh, will be honored to the extent that the masses reject those goals uh, and themselves rank inequality and their own stagnation as more important electorally to them than the exclusion of lots of people and the crying shameful inequality uh, of others. So my suggestion is on strategic grounds we need, uh, if you're not convinced by any moral case, to connect human rights with a broader political agenda, uh, one that a majority will endorse and see as in its interest. And my suggestion is that if we don't get that in left-wing field, we'll get it in right-wing field. Uh, and so in conclusion, uh, that's my case for voting for Bernie Sanders. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Sort of rights 
in its relationship with what seems to be a trend kind of post Citizens United, which sort of de jure says corporations can donate money, and that's a form of free speech that can't be infringed, but also seems to de facto imply that corporations and businesses and I guess public capital has personal and therefore has rights of its own. And if, if capital has rights that can you know, trump literally <laughs> individual human rights, what happens in that kind of world where it's not just a competition of you know, different kinds of human rights and orders, but say, if property, not just property holders has rights, does it look like it just come up in smoke and human beings are kind of just the victims of a legalized sort of, you know, despotism of, of just pure property? Uh, it's, thank you, it's a fantastic question. Um, look, I said that to, to a remarkable extent, human rights um, didn't revert to their 19th century function. But I think as you're pointing out, that's not totally true. Um, because we've reverted to, at least to an extent, in new ways, um, according much greater political and legal protection because it's bought, the protection is bought to the, the wealthy. Now, the way it's done is new. Um, in this country, um, in the Constitution, there's a due process clause and freedom of contract and, and um, protection of property was read into it. Um, but you're right that in our day, uh, the same results are achieved through what the Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan recently called the weaponization of the First Amendment. Um, and that's shameful. So the question, the hard question would be, is that really surprising? Does, is that evidence that Marx was right? either because of the rights form or the fact that judges will routinely protect powerful claimants that offer the, the rights form as something that ought to protect them. Uh, should we just abandon rights? Well, Kagan's view seems to be, you know, that what happened is that reactionaries have taken over American jurisprudence and more is to come with Donald Trump's appointments, and they've weaponized something that in itself is worthy. Now, I don't think she's totally convincing. Um, we don't have a very good record um, of judges being the best stewards of non-weaponized rights in American history. Um, and so my own view is that we should rely less on, on judges and probably disempower our courts, which have historically defended the privileged and wealthy. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't follow if, if you agree with that radical view that we should ditch rights as a cause for social movements, especially free speech, uh, because we do live in an age when um, there are governments that are interfering more and more not just the rights of corporations claiming free speech, but dissidents and others. And so I think you know, my conclusion from your very important comment is that um, we need to distinguish what's new about this what some call First Amendment lockdown and figure out how to respond. Most liberals say, we just have to win the court back. I would say, shut it down and defend rights ourselves. Yes? Uh, perhaps on that, so, uh, in particular in states like my own South Africa and India sort of considered these, you know, great victories when they had the defend very strong constitutions, they've got right. strong constitutional courts that have quite well defended civil liberties over the past 20 years. Yeah. South Africa, for example, has a really thriving press despite the fact that we had a despot right. Jacob Zuma for eight years. But do you think, and you just said you think we should shut the courts down, but do you think the courts can be venues for distributive justice or not at all? Particularly in the developing world where it's really unclear how it is that we can arrive at meaningful political change where you've got corruption at the level of looting almost every state institution and 
no change in vote. I mean, even when you've got a pretty good democracy, like in India or South Africa, very little evidence of political change. What else can we do? What other venue is there for distributive right. justice besides the court? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I, I don't think we should conclude too quickly, um, but we should recognize that, let's say, the bloom is off the rose of the hopes that were at one time proposed um, uh, in judiciaries defending these newly minted economic and social rights. Um, you know, South Africa is a great example of a place where, you know, in the absence of land reform at the time of transition, inequality has skyrocketed. Uh, and of course, it's racialized inequality. Uh, and there was a lot of hope uh, you know, after certain cases, like the Rubel case that was specifically about defending economic and social rights in courts, the tax case, and so forth, um, that not only was this going to provide these, these basic decencies, um, leave out skyrocketing inequality, but that this model could be globalized. And I think it's just turned out that the evidence is depressing, not just in South Africa, where the judiciary has subsequently imposed very strict limits on its own activism. In cases like Masibuko versus Johannesburg. Um, but the, the model has not really traveled. There is some evidence if you take right to food in India or some places in Latin America, but that it's very disputed that judiciaries under certain circumstances can act faithfully in the name of sufficient provision. There's also very scary evidence of coming out of Colombia in particular that kind of what you would expect if you if you provide a right, the people who will defend it are those who are literate and at least well off enough to get their claims ex you know heard by and accepted by judges. And so economic Rights in some places of Latin America have really been like a middle class pensioner's movement, um, not a poor a poor person's movement. So I, my own view is that like in the middle of the 20th century in the welfare state, no one thought of judges as plausible agents of uh, sufficient provision, let alone egalitarian outcomes, because judges had historically been the best friends of contracted property. And so they said, we must win majorities and take over the legislature. Uh, and I think it was it, it was a dreadful liberal error uh, everywhere to give up on that truth uh, because it's proved without majority support that even these judicial victories, when they happen, are short-lived and, and not very impressive. But maybe that's, you know, I don't want to be too much of a downer, but I'm holding out the prospect of, you know, a majority politics that is the only way of institutionalizing justice in the short of all that. Uh, Sam. Yeah. So, being both a lawyer and a philosopher, um, it's, um, so it seems like, it seems like you want to join two different things. Okay. Um, one is concern for um, human rights, and the other is a matter of distributive justice, equal life, inequalities. So on the human rights side, you have this idea of a right to have one's basic needs. But then there you're saying it's, it's just gone awry because it doesn't put any restriction on the degree of inequalities. Uh, just, that's a kind of sufficiency view. So is your idea to somehow incorporate the concern for egalitarian distribution into the, the way we conceive human rights? Um, in, in other words, you could say, look, uh, we have a right to a social minimum. What is that? Well, it's a maximum so social minimum consistent with minimizing inequality or something like that. Uh, or are you conceiving of Human rights is being a separate kind of field or issue, and there's also this requirement of egalitarian distributive justice. In other words, to the extent or sector. Good, good, good. Good. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I must have been unclear on this point because, again, in this wonderful review, Ben saddled me with the opinion that it's kind of human rights' job to be egalitarian and to grow and conquer 
the entire field of social justice. And I don't think I said that. Um, I do want to name and shame human rights for succeeding as a creed and a movement in this world of inequality, but principally to remind us that human rights are just part of morality. Even economic and social rights, as Henry Hsu you know, famously put it, and he's a character in my book, and I do it a kind of story of how he came to write his book, Basic Rights. Um, uh, human rights would be a morality of the depths. Uh, and of course, there are other things to do in morality. Now, the big issue, I think, um, is how important that morality and the depths is relative to our other obligations, including our obligations to live in, build a, a world of, of relative equality. Now, you actually are giving one kind of Rawlsy way in your question of, of, of solving it. Um, you know, my, my, my premise is that um, sufficient provision is not necessarily egalitarian. But I guess it all depends how high we set the threshold. And uh, if you're a Rawlsian, and you say, well, we set it in an egalitarian spirit. Uh, we depart from inequality only to the extent it actually helps ourselves, uh, which is kind of an egalitarian view. Um, and so maybe that's an approach. I myself would, uh, you know, have the view that whatever our, our whatever a moral philosopher might say, institutionally we should have some people focused on sufficient provision, uh, but not at the expense of other movements. Uh, and so I'm um, you know, making a case for the importance and prestige of things like trade unions and socialism and Bernie Sanders. So Berger and McFeldman from the Boston Hall doing some economics program here. Um, so I'm going to ask an annoying question, um, which I'm sure you have a uh, heard before, and making me sound like a neoliberal, which I apologize for. Uh, but so, what's the last 40 years, roughly? We've seen, for instance, in India, female fertility has fallen from five to two. Extreme poverty in the world has fallen from 44 percent to 10 percent. Sure. Uh, and so you made this remark at the end where you said something like, the big winners from this have been the, the, the rich, or, you know, super rich. But maybe an argument can be made that uh, the extreme poor are the great winners if, you know, for sure. if we think that there's diminishing marginal utility or something like that, um, the people at the bottom uh, benefited greatly in the last 40 years and have seen great uh, appreciation in their quality of life and well-being. So, yeah, totally. Uh, so, you know, that, that actually, it, it, it is, it, it, I want to give neoliberalism some love in a sense and acknowledge that its promise that a rising tide would raise all boats was not false. Uh, in many places, and again, the most remarkable example would be China, even more than India, uh, you, you have an extraordinary remediation of extreme poverty coupled with an explosion of, of inequality. And you could, if you're Tom Paine, you're just celebrating because you don't care about inequality, especially if it's driving poverty remediation. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we have to have, we can't just dismiss this result. It's, it's an incredibly progressive result. Stephen Pinker is, you know, very happy right now. Uh, and and uh, so, so there are a couple of, of observations. Um, first, that's improvement, but not optimality. Uh, and if we look, you know, what, what, what the big result in China is that we've, we've taken 700 million people and moved them from extreme poverty to poverty. So now they're making $2 a day instead of less than a dollar in change. Now that's from, you know, progress enlightenment now. But is that the best we could do? More important, does it require an embrace of class inequality? That's the neoliberal belief. And my suggestion is 
that we can use history to remind ourselves that it's not the only path. And we don't have to adopt this deeply selective morality um, where we say we'll get around to inequality someday or it's justified um, because we can actually build institutions that um, achieve some of the impressive results of the past neoliberal period without the huge cost. And again, even if you don't think the inequality is immoral, like neoliberals who have got, you know, following Tom Paine are, are safe in the eyes of, you know, God or whomever morality, uh, they, they're very scared right now. They ought to be because they're experiencing revolts the world over from people who are losing. Your interpretation, which I think is right, is that um, this picture, this distributional picture, is probably better conceived as an alliance of the poor and rich against the middle. Uh, but it turns out that the middle can rock some boats and not just see them rise. And you know, populism is, is something that should, should maybe lead us to want not just achievement, but a more optimal outcomes. It's, of course, it's a great question, not annoying at all. Uh, okay, let's go back, I guess, to do that one. I put on her. Thank you. Um, my name is Eileen Dorian Sill. I teach human rights classes here at Penn. And um, this is super interesting. Um, you mentioned that maybe political parties and workers' uh, trade unions might be better suited to move uh, this vision forward. And I'm trying to think really pragmatically here, regardless of whether it's a human rights movement or trade unions or parties, can you see it being done transnationally? Or do you see solutions and progress more within countries? You know, that's a, that's a great question, and I wish I were better able to answer it, and I have to remain, you know, abstract because I'm not, you know, a policy one of any kind. I mean, you're clearly, you know, putting your finger on something very sensitive, especially to the extent many of the stagnating middle-class voters of populists in the North are still way better off than uh, even some of the wealthy in the global South, and that some of the very modest uh, decrease in global inequality that we've seen since around 1980 is morally justified if you, you know, are a cosmopolitan thinker. I guess I put it this way. Um, Neoliberalism has won out in a variety of national settings and in global governance. Uh, and the immediate question is, how do we change that picture? Well, global governance results from states, uh, and including states allowing um, themselves to be disempowered by other forces um, and you know, give lots of power to central banks or international trade authority, things like that. Um, so my, my, my supposition is that we need to see a breakthrough at ver in various national settings in order to see a, a, a new cosmopolitan project that's not just the protection of local capital. Uh, and so from that, supposition it follows that we have to work at the national level and, and await breakthroughs at least until there's enough energy to proceed to a reform of global governance now that's in that's abstract concretely it does mean potentially protecting northern workers more than they've been protected now hopefully if we massively raise taxes on the rich we'll be able to do so without sacrificing, you know, free trade to the extent it helps, you know, remediate global poverty and so forth and so on. But no one could deny there are very hard choices. And you see that, you know, not to harp on, uh, you know, the senator, but he's famous for saying that open borders is something devised by Charles and David Koch. And his goal, Jen Senator Sanders, seems to be a politician who wants to protect the American working class. Uh, and he's been pressured by the forces in the Democratic 
a primary this year to abandon those views or pretend these for open borders um, and not for you know some kind of immigration reform. But should he or any Democrat get elected, uh, you know, in, in the next round, it will be a very tough situation because they've all basically said they're trending towards open borders, and it's not clear how they can actually live up to those ideas. Not morally just, they, 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 they. So you're raising a huge question. All I can say is that it seems like we need to work nationally for now. Um, that's what happened in the last crisis when um, global capitalism had to be resisted and reformed state by state. That's the story I portrayed of the welfare state. Uh, and then things like Bretton Woods were institutionalized towards the end of that story. Uh, and I think we may have to have a repeat of that cycle. Uh, ben, Professor Nathans. Yes, I'm Ben Nathans, the author of that review. <laughs> uh, of a truly remarkable book. One of the things that I found myself wanting after I finished the book was a clearer sense of why you dislike inequality. Yeah. And I want to push you a little bit on this. Yeah. Do you find it morally offensive in and of itself, or are you a consequentialist? You don't like the effects that it produces. And if the latter, can you clarify specifically what effects you find most uh, reprehensible about inequality? And then related to that, about a third of the way into your talk today, you clarified that you're not demanding or calling for absolute equality, and you recognize that there's right. a long spectrum between sufficiency and the other extreme of absolute material equality. Tell us a little bit about how you think, or how one should think, about where along that spectrum we need to aim for, and how you get there. Great. I mean, those are both really hard questions. Um, and, you know, um, since I'm not in the moral philosophy business, I, I, I feel as if I can assume my answers um, and then tell my historical story of, you know, what other people have believed, how there used to be a lot more people like me than have been around lately. I can ask them how they justified their anger and inequality and how they reached or how John Rawls reached his or their sense of how much inequality is tolerable. But, um, you know, I could kind of try to be slippery and say it's not my job or problem. Um, to you don't want to do that. <laughs> well, so, it, you know, the truth is that, you know, even though I made a kind of heuristic distinction between status and distributive inequality, uh, because it's very important to understand our day, women and men are much more equal in this country, but rich women are less equal to the rest of women in this along the same time span for the last 40 years. And so that distinction is very important. But in the end, it's not clear to me how we can claim to honor the equal status of other human beings if they have different uh, uh, possibilities in life. Uh, it's not clear to me how you can hive off an idea of equal opportunity with different uh, possibilities, especially through parentally transmitted wealth. Um, and so it's just not clear to me precisely how we could ever sustain any notion that inequality is just, except perhaps on the Rawlsian ground that it's just if it serves the worst of makes the worst off better off. Uh, so those are all good ideas. Um, you know, one problem we have is that the day of Rawls propounded that notion, what he called the difference principle, began to be less and less honored in the class structure of his own country, uh, which, you know, should depress us about the importance of philosophical principle. So my, I guess my, my, my real way of wriggling out of your question would be to say, 
no one in the past has needed the answers to your question. They just know when equality is wrong, and they struggle to end it to the extent they could, consistent with growth and maybe poverty remediation, and seeing how far they can beat their enemies. Why isn't that good enough for me? Well, I think I'm not optimistic. No, we're at the end of our time, so. Uh, <laughs>